Happy Independence Day, everyone. We celebrate the magnificent and unique freedom fought for and won by our forefathers. Not just for us, but for every generation since. We thank our God for this great nation and the freedom we have to worship him this day. Let us do so now, now as we pray. Gracious, mighty God in heaven, you are indeed marvelous in every way that we can think of. You are um, holy, holy, holy. That means you are righteous and you are unique. There is no other God but you. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help us always to see your majesty in the beauty of nature around us and in the beauty of your word that we've been learning over the over the last several weeks. And we pray that you would help us to be bold in our commitment to you. And Father, as we celebrate today, as we celebrate both the freedom of this nation, which you granted us, and uh, as we celebrate the, the love of Jesus, for he died for us, we pray that you would move among us and that you let us grab just a glimpse of your glory. Thank you so much for everyone that will be a part of this celebration. Help us to just drop all our anxiety and struggles and be able to lift up our souls to you in praise. Thank you so much for all you've done in and through Jesus' name. Amen. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above, from the mountains. To the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. One more time, sing it with us. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam. God bless. On December 23rd, 1776, the American army was defeated. It had started the war in April of that year with the, sound, the, the shot that was heard around the world. Remember that? And... They had some successes, but starting in like August, they lost New York. They lost almost every battle, um, battle to Cornwallis, and it was just looking bad. And soldiers started leaving. When their time, their signed up time, their contract was over, they went back home. They wouldn't re-sign up. It was tough on, on General George Washington. He didn't know what to do. He was disturbed by it. And, and Thomas Paine, who had written that um, beautiful, um, I don't know if you call it an article or um, some kind of, a little booklet, a pamphlet that just stirred the people, called Common Sense. 
He stepped up and he knew what was going on. He understood he'd been to the front line. And then he went back and wrote this, these lines. It's called The Crisis. I'm just going to read the first paragraph. You don't want me to read the whole thing. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. George Washington read that article and he told all his soldiers they should read it and they should hear it together. So he gathered them all together and read the whole article called The Crisis. And it, it went through all the reasons why we had it. Uh, like um, his first pamphlet talking about stirring the whole nation into a fervor to have fight for our freedom. This inspired the soldiers. And in the next couple days, they posed for that for that uh, trip across the, the river into Trenton, New Jersey. It was dedication that moved them now. And on the uh, on Christmas Day, they w floated across the river. And George Washington sent some men on the bridge farther up the river and some men farther down the river to ford across to march through on a more shallow area. And he took his men across and they surrounded Trenton, New Jersey, where the Haitian army who had been beating them left and right and left and right, uh, were all celebrating their, uh, their victories and Christmas day. We're all drunk. They won that battle and they started winning battle after battle. And we began to win the war. It was going to be a long, hard fought war. But these people were so devoted that they kept going. They kept fighting and more people kept joining. More patriots kept joining the battle to fight for the freedom that we have. The wonderful thing is devotion is always admired. When you're devoted to a cause, people admire you and think that's great. And today's lesson that we get, today's message we get, is a fascinating one because it talks about devotion, but it surrounds that devotion with um, love. I tried, I wanted to call it devotion on a love sandwich, but Trudy wouldn't let me do that. So it's just called surrounded by love. And here it goes. Take a look at uh, Psalm 119, verses 57 through 64. This would be the letter Keth, okay? And so all the words on the beginning of each phrase starts with the letter Keth, the Hebrew letter Keth. You are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my way and have turned my eyes to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked be, uh, bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. At midnight, I rise up to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. So what we have here is a, a, a surrounding of the covenant with a devotion to the covenant that is surrounded by God's grace and love. And that's what he's appealing for. That's what the author, which we've talked about before, and I, I think it's, is Ezra, um, 
the author is saying, I, I'm devoted to you, but thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for putting up with my flaws and know that I am carrying out with devotion the things that I have. The first thing he says in verse 59, 57 uh, through 58, he's talking about God's grace and his appeal to God for God's grace. And verse uh, 64 is talking again about God's grace and, and love that surround, that fills the whole world. Um, but 59 says this, I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. In other words, I am devoted to God's covenant. I am devoted to your covenant. God loves devotion to his covenant. That's what he inspires. That's what he loves to see. Remember the story about Jacob and Esau? Remember how uh, God says I uh, in Romans the the ninth chapter it says God loved Jacob but he didn't love but he hated Esau not because of you know just preferring someone over the other what he understood as he saw as we see in Genesis the story of Jacob and Esau that Esau really didn't care about his relationship with God. He had much more important things to do. He had to go out hunting. He had to, he had, he collected wives left and right. Um, and he didn't care about his, when, when he was offered an opportunity, when he, when he was hungry, it was more important to eat food than it was to worry about who got the inheritance, which the inheritance came along with the covenant. And you'll see that down through Abraham to Isaac. Isaac, Abraham handed the covenant off to Isaac. Isaac to Jacob because Esau didn't want it, didn't care about it. And Jacob then to his 12 sons, but majorly to Joseph uh, and their two sons, his two of his sons. So Joseph didn't get an inheritance, but his two sons did instead of him. Um, got the covenant with them. And there was a passion in Joseph's heart for the covenant. So God is looking for people all along who will be devoted to his covenant, will keep the covenant. At that time, it was the old covenant. At this time, it's the new covenant, keeping the new covenant, opening our hearts and our minds to what the word has to say, not try to find excuses to get around it. You know, well, God says this, but I think I, I think I can apply this instead. That doesn't work. God has a covenant laid out. He told us what he likes and what he doesn't like. And he says, follow this and you'll be fine. Keep my commandments and that will be good. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And my commandments aren't that hard. We find out in First John uh, when he says, my, you keep my commandments, and they're, they're easy, they're new and they're old. They're old because it was from the beginning that I really wanted them, but they're new because we've shown you how it happens. You love your, you love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself. So keep those commandments. Make it your your cause. You're devoted to the law. Now we're not talking about bibliology, right? The worship of the Bible. He doesn't want that. He he wants worship of himself because of the Bible, because of what it says, how it opens up, and what it's about. Then he said, besides that, the first devoted. There are six devotions that we we see here. Six. Six twice, or there we go. There are six devotions um, that he that he mentions here. First of all, devoted to the covenant. Secondly, devoted to urgency, the urgency of the covenant. He's urgently does that. And you and I know what that's like, right? We ask someone to do something and they'll say, yeah, we'll do it. And then they do it at their own good time, at their own good pleasure, whatever that is. It, this is not talking about that. This is uh, verse 60. Let me read it to you. Uh, I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. How many times have Trudy asked me to do something and I'll say, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And then when I get around to it or when she reminds me the third or fourth time it happens, that was the way it was with mom. I would tell her, oh, mom, I love you. Oh, dad, I love you. But whenever they asked me to do something, I always put it off. 
He's not saying that. He's saying, I, as soon as I know that there's something I need to do, I will do it. I do it immediately because you ask, because I love, because I desire to follow your covenant and to love, express my love for you. So there is an urgency to it. Don't put off what you already know, to, what you know and understand. That's what Paul says in Philippians. He tells us, uh, just live up to what you already know. That's all you have to do. And you'll do just fine. You know the rights and the wrongs. You know the, what God is pleased with and what God is not pleased with. Live up to what you know and you'll do just fine, right? Be urgent about it. Then he says in verse 61, he says this. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your laws. So I'm going to look at that in two different ways. I'll take that, come back and get that again in just a little bit. The first thing, though the wicked bind me with ropes, I'm thinking that binding, it reminds me of, um, of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, where it talks about taking off all the things that slow you down in running the, the race for God. That's what I'm thinking of. All the things that, that impede me. The wicked around the world are always trying to just stop us from living a Christian life. They don't like it that we do. They despise Christianity in so many different ways. And, and so they'll ridicule us. They'll tease us. And they'll give us a whole bunch of different distractions. Wonderful TV shows that we just can't give up wonderful things that we need to collect in our lives. And he's saying, don't get bound by those things. Don't let the world trip you up. Don't squeeze into peer pressure. You are a Christian. You are devoted to Christ and his covenant, his new covenant with you. So live according to that. Don't uh, so be devoted despite distractions, all the distractions around the world. And then we could look at this another way. And when, when we read this, listen carefully. This is verse 61. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. Now we could take that literally. And we can say what he's talking about is persecution. Be devoted through persecution. And though the wicked tie me up, though they punish me, though they do terrible things to me, though I am persecuted literally, like in China, where they're just boldly trying to squish and squeeze Christianity out of their people. 93 million communists who are part of the Communist Party are, are there because they, they want to be a part of it. But the growing part of China, the growing, the excited, the, the moving part of China are those who are Christians, who will suffer whatever the cause. And the more that the communists push against them, the stronger they become. And the more people fall into line with them. Isn't that some persecution tends to make us stronger in Christianity? I, I wouldn't pray for persecution. It's kind of nice to have the freedom to get together and worship like we do. It's not like they do in China where um, they get together in houses. Um, you know, like they're going to a potluck and they'll come in one or two at a time and they'll eat the meal together and they'll sing some songs quietly and softly. And they lie down and one man starts telling a story from the Bible. He's the storyteller. And they're all lying there like they're taking a nap and they're listening to what he has to say. That way, if some, if some uh, communist comes in through the door, they can just say, oh, we're just telling stories. That's all. I think that's very moving. In, in North Korea, there's a growing church there too. And in North Korea, they just wander out into the woods together and kind of assemble and have a little worship service, quiet, where nobody uh, is. And they just get together and worship God there. So we want to be devoted through persecution. And that might be coming to our shores. Communism or something like it. 
where they want to squeeze out our commitment to the word. They want to tell us that, well, you don't have to believe it all. In fact, if you believe this word, if you believe this Bible, you could be labeled a bigot. Uh, so we need to go to the next one. Okay, so we've gone through uh, devoted to God's covenant. We're devoted to urgency in it, keeping it immediately. We're devoted despite the distractions that are around us. We're devoted through persecution. Number five is we're devoted through inconvenience. Take a look at this. He says in uh, 62, at midnight I rise up to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I get sleeping along and I'm doing just fine in my sleep. And then I, during my dreams, I think of your righteous laws. I wake up and I start singing. I give, give you thanks. Oh, Father God, thank you so much for your righteous laws, for, for being so giving and so kind, for letting us know how you think and what you think and how we should live since we're made in your image. Let us bow in devotion at midnight. If you're waking up there, it, it's not convenient. Church time isn't always convenient. It's right in the middle of Sunday morning. The only day you have to, to relax and get away, then some stupid person puts along a worship service on Sunday morning and yet you come. Yet you're willing to put aside going shopping. Yet you're willing to put aside uh, putting your uh, your feet up and reading the newspaper or watching TV and having a little breakfast and relaxing that one day you have off. Oh yeah, you work from five in the morning till nine at night and find, come home, shove a couple of bites into your mouth, put the dishes off to the side and go to bed to start over again each day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday, what do you have to do? All those dishes piled up, you have to clean them. The, all the mess that you've made of the house, you have to clean it. All the, the lawn growing, you, you have to clean that up. All these things need to be done on Saturday. So you've got, you've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday all filled up. What do you want to do on Sunday? It's truly your only day off. Yet you will get in the car. You'll get up early. You'll get in the car. And you'll get to church. And you'll worship there with fellow believers. All who have decided that it's okay to give up the convenience of their life to worship together. They're willing to sacrifice because Jesus sacrificed everything for us. Then we go on. Okay, so we've got devoted to God's covenant. We've got devoted to urgency. We've got devoted to, despite distractions all around that the world is trying to keep us away from God. Devoted through persecution. Devoted through inconvenience. We also need to be devoted to fellow believers. Look at this, verse 63. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. If there's somebody out there that loves Jesus, if there's somebody out there that loves God, if there's somebody out there that loves the word and wants to follow it and is devoted to it, I I don't care who they are. I don't care what they do. I don't care um, anything else. I just love them because they are fellow devotees to Jesus Christ. Whatever whatever creed they come from, it doesn't matter because I love them for their love for Jesus. I'll bind with them. I'll search for fellowship with them. I'll yearn for them. I'll pray for them during the week. I'll be thinking of them as and want a fellowship, want to be supportive to, to, their, uh, to their Christianity and their life. Inspiring each other to be devoted wants to another, not giving up the assembling of ourselves together as some do. Oh, why are we doing that? Because we're surrounded by love. We're surrounded by the grace of God. We're surrounded by uh, the love of God who gave up his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, the question is, 
Are you devoted to God and his covenant? Is it urgent? Are you devoted despite all the distractions that the world tries to lay down, all the persecution that the world could bring on us, all the inconvenience that it causes? You know, you have to gather with the fellow believers. Is that, are you, are you there? If not, I pray that you will be. I pray that you say, wow, this makes more sense to me. Loving this Bible. Why do I love this Bible? Because it's so evidently written by a mind that, that has lasted, lasts for eternity, exposing himself to us and using different people from all around. And we see that it's constantly corroborated in the sciences, in archaeology, in history we go back and we find constant references to different things we can say yeah I, I trust it because of that oh would you join me in prayer and that you might submit yourself to Jesus Christ and if you're following Jesus Christ and forgot to be devoted remember that you are because of his love most gracious mighty God in heaven thank you so much for your word help us to be devoted to you in all that we say and all that we do in our lifestyle so that the world sees us and says i can't distract that person i can't stop them the more i make it hard for them the more they they're committed to and father if there's anyone here who through this message has found a desire to be devoted to you let them speak it out. Let them tell others. Let them call us and let, let us know. Let them click on our website and, and connect with us, Father. We love you so much. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we celebrate every week the same thing. We celebrate the covenant that we're just talking about, that God made. We're not like Esau who gave it up for a morsel of food. We're like Jacob who hung on to it with his whole life, held on to God to give him a, a promise of, of greater things. So it's in this that we take the cup, the body of Jesus Christ. He says, this is my body broken for you take and eat all of it. That means consume him. Let it, let him live in you. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. Then he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the sins of many. That means that this blood washes away our sins, cleans us from everything that we've done and offers us a purpose of life and so we partake of it together in remembrance of him proclaiming that he died for us and that he was buried that he rose again and that he's coming back most gracious mighty god in heaven thank you so much for the promise what we just took for the reminder of all this and help us to live in devotion and dedication celebrating your grace and your love thank you for surrounding us with that love in jesus name amen well thank you for joining our short service this morning don't forget that our expenses continue and we need your tithes and offerings oh and by the way i'm not sure that we'll be doing this on uh, at this time we'll be recording it a live service and and sending it out through youtube and facebook at the same time uh so uh we'll be figuring out how and when we're going to do that we want to taper off a little bit and probably do that uh so don't forget our expenses continue and we need your tithes and offerings your support um we love all our first responders who've helped us get through so much of COVID. 
Uh, we're praying that you would, uh, that God will bless them. We love our medical professionals in the front line of this battle, our truckers, our delivery people, all our essential workers, those grocery guys you see uh, doing their thing. And, and boy, just imagine without all these people doing these things, what it would be like. As Paul says to the Ephesians, grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. See you next week. God bless.